Hey everybody, welcome to the channel. So admittedly, this was a video I hadn't planned on doing, but the comment section talked me into it. So here we go. Today I need to try and get the remaining rusty and stuck steering clutch off of 2115's back end. In the prior episode, I put my hollow ram on here. It didn't have enough pull to do it. We have not only the press fit, but I'm pretty sure some significant rust and corrosion that's sticking us in place. So I mentioned then that my next attempt was going to involve some heat around that hub, but I first have to get those six sets of springs out of here because if I introduce heat in here, it's gonna ruin all of them. Now, why do I say sets of springs? We'll take a look at the parts manual diagram. That is a double spring setup. So they have a spring inside of a spring and they are retained to the pin by a retainer and a pair of locks. So I'm going to need to compress those springs to remove those locks and retainers, release tension, get those springs off of there. In order to do that, I'll use this. It's my homemade version of the Caterpillar factory compressor tool for those steering steering clutch springs. Ah, sorry, tripping over my tongue. So we'll go into my Caterpillar service tools catalog. You can see there's what a cat setup would look like. And it's basically a stop block on the backside, a long piece of threaded rod, various sized adapters to go on various sized steering clutches. And it looks like this one has a bearing under the nut for compressing everything. But we'll also take a look at the Caterpillar D2 service manual and it shows a very similar setup. So you can see the stop block on the back and then the forcing screw comes up through. The disc basically compresses all six springs at one time. You can gain access to remove those locks and then release tension, start taking it apart. So in my home built version, it's made to go in conjunction with this old puller setup. So if I had a clutch already removed and on a bench, this block at the back would be what the bar accomplishes. And the long threaded rod that goes up the center would be the forcing screw from that old puller. And basically, you know, you can see the plate. That's what I made. So dimensions on this, it's half inch thick steel. Outside diameter is five and a half inches across. The center hole is three quarters because this is a three quarter by 16 thread pitch forcing screw. Also happens to be the same thread pitch as the bolts that held those steering clutches onto the bevel gear shaft. We'll come back to that in a minute. And I made my six holes 15 sixteenths of an inch diameter so that I can get in there and have room to take those retainers, those locks out, and then start backing all the tension off. And now for the reason why I went with half inch thick steel to make that disc, it's going to have to withstand a fair amount of pressure in order to compress all six of those sets of springs at one time. I wanted something that I was going to be sure was not going to deform. So I condensed the pertinent data off of my specification sheet here for Caterpillar D2 steering clutches. It's such fine print because it has many, many models on there. But in a nutshell, the D2 steering clutch springs, outer springs, I should say, will exert 147 to 163 pounds pressure at an assembled length of three and 15 30 seconds of an inch. The inner springs will each exert 113 to 125 pounds of pressure at their assembled length of three and seven 30 seconds. So each individual pair can exert from 260 to 288 pounds onto that clutch pack. All six pairs in total, you're looking at 15 to 1700 pounds of pressure that you have to compress. So I wanted to have a disc and a tool that was plenty robust enough to get the job done. And going back to the fact that it shares the same thread pitch as the bolt that retains the steering clutches to the bevel gear, this gives me the flexibility to also use it directly on a tractor in a scenario such as this. So I can just run that forcing screw into the bevel gear shaft, assemble that compressor on here, handle all the work, and then remove it all get in there and continue on my way. So it gives me enough flexibility. I can either work on the bench on an already disassembled clutch pack or I can actually work on the tractor. So pretty happy with the setup. Well worth the time it takes to make it. Let's put it to use. First thing I'm gonna do here is take a socket and a soft face hammer and just kind of tap those retainers. I'm just trying to loosen the rust bonds between the locks and the retainers. Sometimes, if you hit these really hard, you can't get the retainers to fall out without having to put the tool on. Most times not, because these are more of a square cut retainer rather than the tapered wedge style. So most times, 
they don't fall out for you. Feels like we've got them all moving. So the disc is assembled with the nut and washers onto the forcing screw. So I'll get that threaded in, engage just as many threads as I can in that bevel gear shaft because, well, why not, right? Now I just line the disc up with all the pins and run the nut and the washers down to it. Now we compress. Here we've had a couple blocks fall out. These 15 16 diameter holes seem to be a good size to get in there and work. Some of these keepers are still stuck in their grooves though. Here, got that one to move. It'll take a little bit of persuasion to get them dug out because everything here is so rusty. There's another one. Now with all 12 keepers removed, we can back the tool off. When you get up to this point, it's a good idea to tap it from time to time to make sure none of these retainers are hanging on the groove on the end of the pins. Sometimes they can do that. Now we can pull springs. Inners and outers. Some of these are actually rusted into the drum. There we go. There are times when you get into D2 steering clutches that are really rusted bad and bad enough that the clutch pack actually swelled it will push that pressure plate so far back that it'll coil bind these springs. And if they're already coil bound because the pack is swelled up, you just gotta cut it apart. There's no way you can get that tension off the springs. So at that point, you pretty much write all these off anyway. But thankfully, this one was not that bad. So the plan was to relocate outside for this next step, but literally five minutes ago, Mother Nature saw fit to make it start snowing. So impeccable timing as usual. We'll work in the doorway here, it'll be fine. So now we're ready for some heat. So I've got the big screw puller on there. We're not gonna use the hollow ram. We're just gonna use this in its original state and we don't have a lot of tension on it yet. Actually, none at all, because I prefer not to heat with raging amounts of tension on things. It's just, you know, something I just don't do. So we will apply the heat first. I can roll this all around. We can get all in everywhere. And then once the heat is on, we'll go ahead and crank this thing down. That might make it pop. If it doesn't, we'll just let this sit out here and cool. Because there's been times where I've put heat on a tapered press fit and I can't get it to pop when it's hot. 
But after I come back and everything is completely cooled down, this thing's mysteriously loose. You know, that expansion, contraction, everything else does wonders. So that's the plan here. I got the torches rolled up. Let's start playing with some fire. All right, we've got heat. The center hub was just starting to glow red, and I can smell grease burning from the release bearing on the back side, so I know we're heated throughout. Let's see if it pops. <sighs> That's almost as much force as I can put on it by hand. Let's try one more time here. Okay, that's all I can do. Another reason why I chose not to use the hollow ram is because just with the regular forcing screw style puller, I'm not afraid to tap the end of the shaft. I'm not saying the hollow ram won't hold up to that. I'm just saying I won't do it to mine. <laughs> Let's do what we can to shock that hub. Oh, I got a little bit more turn on it. Try tapping one more time. If that doesn't do it, we'll just let it cool. Come back and check it in an hour. Well, I've kept busy straightening the shop up somewhat. I've begun crating up all of my good, still usable Caterpillar D2 clutch parts. Took some time and cleaned up the little mini lathe over here. That bench was getting rather nasty, but let's walk out and we'll see how that puller's doing. Like I said, it's been about an hour. Just have a look at things here. You know what? Let's see if I can pick it up. See a little bit of a air gap right there between that hub and that disc. Huh, look at that. It loosened up. I think it's loose. Yeah, you can see the whole face moving. It loosened up. Like I said before, something about heating it, applying pressure, and then waiting for that cool down it's weird. I didn't hear a pop or a bang or anything. It's like you walk back out after these have cooled back down and a lot of times those tapered press fits are loose. So calling it a success. Our stop bolt worked well again. That is one handy little tool. Okay, it should have come off of there. Well, the hub is loose, the front moves around. Back plate is... Huh. The back plate's tight yet, yeah, well... Let's, let's remove what we can, shall we? 
Okay. So there's our center hub with all the discs. Boy, that was rusty in there, even in the splines. So, looks like the center of that one survived. This is something I've never seen before. Get closer here. So, this back pressure plate has a bronze bushing in here and it should just drift freely on the bevel gear shaft. Trouble is, it is rusted tight to it. So we're still not out of the woods. We still got a piece to get off of here. This is the first. I've never had one that was rusty enough to stick that pressure plate on there. That should just slide right off. But yeah, look at look at the rust coming out of there. Wow. Starting to build between the discs even. All right. So now we fight this piece. All right. I got the three jaw puller on it. Full disclosure, this is a very sketchy setup. The flange here is not that thick, and it's a really good way to break that. I don't think that's going to happen because I, I tapped around gently on the face, and that pressure plate did want to drift inboard somewhat, so I don't think it's completely seized. So, okay. I think it moved a little bit by hand. I'm going to have to put a wrench on it. Yeah, it's tightening up a little bit. Just shocking things a little bit, hopefully knock some rust loose. That seemed to have helped it a little bit. Moved out a little ways before I break anything. I'm going to try and tap it back in. We'll clean that shaft a little bit, probably get some penetrating oil on there, and then repeat the process. All right, so far, round two has been going a bit better. Got some of the rust out of there. Got some penetrating oil on the surfaces. Things seem to be moving a little bit easier. So just keep working it off. Not super worried about saving this plate because I got a lot of them and they don't usually go bad anyway. But we don't want to needlessly break things if we can avoid it. I think we got it on the run now. There we go. Take our stop bolt out of there once again. This thing is just handy for everything. <laughs> there we go. Oh, there. I mean, it doesn't look horrible in there. You can see there's a lot of that black powdery rust, but yeah, there's that bushing that is supposed to be a free floating fit on the shaft. And now we can finally get the oak out of there, but you'll notice this right here. Now, remember the last episode of the 1113 series when I was removing these banjo bolts and everything that anchor this yoke to that release bearing housing, I mentioned that sometimes I've had to cut those apart because those yoke bolts actually seize, and that's what this one did. I got it several turns out. Come on, get that lock out of the way. There we go. You can see 
I got it probably a good half of the way out and then all of a sudden it's like it galled and it just stopped moving. I couldn't make it go in or out and at that point these yolks aren't that hard to come by. Again I got a lot of them and they don't usually wear out. It's time just to cut that segment out of there so you can disengage that from the release bearing. Another reason I had to cut it, that release bearing is locked up tight. It does not spin anymore. So even to get the whole bevel gear shaft to spin, I had to cut that piece out of there. So we're writing this one off, but take this out just like the rest of them. I also had another question in the comment section about this ball at the bottom and the socket that it pivots in, asking if that socket was hardened, if it wears out. Honestly, I've never seen one of those worn out. I've never seen one of the, the balls on the bottom of the yoke worn out either. I think both those pieces are very, very hard. So anyway, we finally got that clutch off of there. It was a battle. It certainly didn't want to come out. So at the end of the day, we did it. There's a lot of scrap down there. I'll take that clutch the rest of the way apart, see if there's anything in there we're saving with the hub, pressure plate, all that. But it's, well, a demonstration of another way to do it if you either don't have hydraulic pullers that are capable enough or you don't have hydraulic pullers at all, there's always another option. There's always another set of tools you could use. And most importantly, there's always another strategy that you can take. Um, granted, I make a lot of my own little special tools now. My plug bolt, my spring compressor disc in conjunction with other factory made things. But I dug back in the archives and I dug that out. You know what that is? You see it's made out of a piece of, oh, I think it's quarter inch. It's all rough cut with the torch. That was my first steering clutch spring compressor. Granted, it didn't do all six springs at one time, but it could do two at a time. You know, it's something that, well, I was 20 years old. I had my first D2. I had no money. I had no means. I didn't even have a three quarter inch drill bit. <laughs> you see that rough cut hole in the center there? But yeah, I just torched it out and kind of ground the slag off. And you know what? It worked. So it's part of the process. You don't always start out, you know, with the best equipment or even with, you know, the greatest skill set. But you can't be afraid to try. You can't be afraid to fail because you do most of your learning through failure. I did a lot and I still fail from time to time, breaking pressure plates, you know, things like that. But basically what I'm getting at is where there's a will, there's a way. So, you know, if you're thinking about tackling a job like that on a crawler or anything, and you might be discouraged, you know, when, when a lot of fancy tools get pulled out and things just get blasted apart through, you know, brute force and raw power. And there's always another way to do it. And there's a lot of guys did a lot of bush fixes on these old cats back in the day using tension, using heat, and utilizing time. And of course, you know, their own ingenuity. So where there's a will, there's a way. So we all start somewhere. Thanks for watching everybody. We got that rusty stuck clutch off of there. We can continue with teardown now. Hope to see you back again.